um, the importance of the actual geological map for all of the geology and geophysics that we do in the whole mountain belt. It's absolutely amazing to think back that 90 years ago, Argan was already on the basis of the mapping of the 19th and 20th centuries, early, early, was understanding that India was underthrusting Asia in a big way. And uh, to get you back there, we've invited a, a giant of the mapping of the Himalaya Tibet, uh, Mike Searle from Oxford, no connections with MIT, I think. Um, been up in that mountain, those mountains for more than 30 years. Not only a geologist, uh, with great collaboration with uh, especially the isotope I heard, dating world, but with the uh, stratigraphers and the paleontologists and everyone else, um, but also a climber, a mountaineer who's not been afraid to go to the highest parts of the mountains and to produce new maps of Everest and the like. So, Mike, we're very glad to have you here. We know that you have been stricken by Vienna. Several of us were in Vienna, have not come back and... Uh, are half dying, but we realize that you'll probably survive the next 40 minutes or so. And please take the scene and yeah. show us your <coughs> Himalaya. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, David. Um, I do apologize to start with. I'm on the, the process of losing my voice. I hope it's going to last for the next 40 minutes. But should I just suddenly go quiet, it means that... <coughs> You just need to look at the slides, because a lot of the writing is on the slides. <clears throat> OK, well, as David said, I'm going to talk about the geological record with the Himalayas, which is uh, the greatest mountain range on our planet, and one that is uh, very young and actively ongoing. Uh, so the two, two of the major tectonic uh, processes that we're looking at are the lateral extrusion of the Tibetan Plateau, the eastwards extrusion as a result of the Indian collision, uh, first proposed by Molnar and Tapanier many, many years ago. And the second one is the channel flow model, which is along the crest of the greater Himalayas. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge some 30 years of friendship with Peter, who's uh, come with us in the field and I think one of the most impressive things is that Peter climbs mountains and uh, stands on active faults. This is the Karakoram Fault. And he certainly kept me uh, grounded in his geophysical uh, concepts. So hopefully what I'm going to talk about the geology doesn't clash too much with the geophysics. Uh, so this is an outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to start off by looking at the Himalaya, the metamorphism, melting, and the channel flow. Oh, dear God. And uh, then look at Tibet, and the, particularly the timing of crustal thickening and the uplift of the plateau, what could, we can infer from the geologic record. And then the strike slip faults and lateral extrusion. And finally, I'll uh, take a brief look at the Karakoram. So the starting point of all of this <coughs> is really the india Asia collision. And you can define it a number of ways. Uh, my favorite way of defining it is when the ocean Neotethys finally vanished and it's at exactly that horizon there. This is a mountain in southern Tibet. And all of these rocks were marine limestones, and they're overlain by this continental molass. When you collect uh, rocks from the uh, youngest marine sediments, that band there, it is full of pneumolites, which belong to the planktonic foraminifera zone P8. And that is the youngest marine sediment exposed anywhere in the Indus Sutra zone and on the northern margin of India. And it's particularly known from Waziristan, Ladakh, and southern Tibet, continental Malat. When you collect uh, rocks from the uh, youngest marine sediments, that band there, it is full of pneumolites, which belong to the planktonic foraminifera zone P8. And... <coughs> that is the youngest marine sediment exposed anywhere in the Indus Sutra zone and on the northern margin of India. And it's particularly known from Waziristan, Ladakh, and southern Tibet. <coughs> so, um, I take as a uh, ballpark figure 50 million years. This coincides with the uh, 
decrease in the drift of India after the collision, which we've already heard about, and uh, various stratigraphic units on there. This is what the uh, pneumolites look like. They're quite spectacular for fossils. They're about as big as your fingernail. And these fossils are less than a million years in their evolutionary cycle. So the oil companies use this all the time in the Middle East for data. very, very precise dating through the Cenozoic units. A picture taken in Ladakh. This is the main Indus River. Lay is over here. And these are all the rock types you see in the suture zone. Tethian oceanic sediments, exotic blocks, and these green rocks here are serpentinized Hartsburgites and Dunites uh, belonging to the remnant Ophiolites. There's a few high-pressure rocks and uh, the post-collisional molasse sediments, all of these rocks here. So that marine continental divide is a stratigraphic horizon that is present all over the Zanskar Ladakh Himalayas, and it's very spectacularly well exposed. So after 50 million years, there was no more Tethys between India and Asia, at least from uh, Waziristan on the western margin of the plate all the way along the Indus Suture Zone in Tibet. Uh, the Himalayas are actually a very simple mountain range, unlike the Alps and many of the older ones. Uh, there's three major units in here, which is, this is Roger Billum's diagram of the... <laughs> That's interesting because it's the result of a supernova, which is a singular event rather than like a continuous ripple be from a wave traveling through and along the edge and pushing in into the edge of the continental shelf, just push, causing uh, crumpling and the lifting of mountain ranges from compression along of a force along the edge of the continental shelf. Imagine this is <clears throat> causing a, a uplift, although in this case it's from a supernova from this direction of a particle that was underneath the crust that had a pressure applied, maybe also had a current flowing from ether storm going through the earth. Maybe the current passed through nodes on the way, and one of the paths it took was through the node over here, and maybe that caused an upwelling of an initial... Uh, oceanic crust basically which is denser material that was released only because of a gaping holes in the earth due to ether flows passing through it Tethian upper crust which is the folded and thrusted sedimentary rocks dominantly Permian and Mesozoic the Greater Himalayas, which is all high-grade metamorphic rock. This is definitely a reaction within a series of reactions. Uh, it's really hard for me to go through and elaborate on what I just said without just like being like, see previous. <laughs> <laughs> but in short, in short, let me just. Essentially, this region is a shallogram, <clears throat> which is these types of things. It's one of these, especially like this, sticking, protruding out of the ground as a mountain chain called the Himalayas. <clears throat> and here is one of the Shaligram features of two openings with a center region where the chakras are. <clears throat> so I believe, based on the expanding Earth model that I discussed in the Dwarka, ancient Dwarka video, the, sec the secrets of Mount Gurnar, I believe that water... <clears throat> was physically here, maybe even it was frozen, I just realized, maybe it was uh, solidified 
<clears throat> so it's just sitting there, maybe even applying a pressure and just building up more water as it flowed from other regions. Although I'm not completely sure if this is why maybe energy flows just through the earth just cause this to happen without an actual overlaying pressure. But I think the overlaying pressure, <clears throat> so essentially there's particles in the earth that are larger than atoms but smaller than planets that function just like every other particle where they can also supernova. Everything gets supernova. We call it radioactive decay. We call it excited electrons, but they're all the same mechanic. And so can these particles within the Earth, apparently. <clears throat> Some of them being big enough where they literally, from this, so what I think is a, a, a energy of water was flowing in this direction, applying a pressure on the surface, and the surface itself <clears throat> was resting on this particle largely as like a pillar, where its surroundings were not as rigid, so it was <clears throat> much more like this, so like this, so here's a particle, say, and surrounding is less dense material, so if there's a weight on this, say this is the top side, if there's a weight on it, it's going to actually, even though it's on the whole thing, it's going to actually be pressing through this section, causing an actual pressure into the particle, which then in the instance of the Himalayas exploded in a supernova, pushing the Himalayas into existence. So that's what we're analyzing, is that analysis there for evidence, which is actually building, uh, I assure you. <laughs> <clears throat> this explains a lot of things that are kind of hard to explain otherwise, like the the degree of folding in the region, <clears throat> the the direction, the, the projection of the material at a low angle, because it was basically from the particle. Under the under the crust's upper layer right here, that's physically existed, and then it physically supernovaed from the pressure on it, which is like this, literally like a shallogram. So we can go through shallograms. Here's a here's a a sphere particle. So in essence, this particle is kind of stable. It's not like under experiencing a compressive force that's causing it to like smush outward whereas this one has been so smushed outward that it began to take lines on the side which is only apparent if we see it basically in different stages so like this one this one has the lines on the side, but they haven't divided into an upper half and a lower half, but it's also not as as compressed. It's more spherical still. Whereas the this one is much more compressed, much more elongated, where it physically has like a one of those pressure systems where they take like a tennis ball and squish it it's pretty much that's what's going on here and it's physically causing f fracturing and faults in the sphere of the object as well as a divide down the middle as it separates into constituents that were seemingly always part of it but were hidden in the in the subtleness of the well this one doesn't have a particle in the subtleness of the of the sphere like there is no evidence that if this particle were to experience similar circumstances that it would because this is a particle this is literally like an atom on a different scale 
that has supernova into its surroundings, producing dendritic features which are present in the Himalayas. Where the energy basically propagated down a channel, producing higher mountains, down a channel, down, chan down channels, that then f fingered out in a dendritic way and interlocked the negative channels in a dendritic way to a point where that is what happens because this literally is the result of a supernova of a particle that then literally produced a gaping hole in the earth that was filled in with just debris and then sand to a point where it just is this probably I'm, I'm very curious to look into this region like, it seems like, like people travel over it. <laughs> like, is there a lot of, like, quicksand in this region? Like, don't go to this region. It appears like you'll just sink into the, uh... <laughs> because you're literally falling into the earth, into a void below where the sand just drops into an actual opening. And maybe it's not that far, so maybe you land on some rocks and you're like in an opening and see like a ceiling, but probably not. Probably fucking far, like a shallogram far. Oops. Like suddenly, <clears throat> you're just falling into this way, like right in here, into it. But, like, this is the side of the earth, so you're just falling into the earth. And I would say there's a possibility in the in this region of something of that nature. I'd be very curious to look for stories I haven't yet, but it's on my to-do list. So if anyone knows, just let me know. Point me in a direction. Dominantly slimonite and kyanite gneisses and magnetites, and this is what is flowing... Uh, and the Lesser Himalayas, which is the old uh, margin of the Indian plate, accreted. So when you restore, in a very simple way, all the thrust sheets in the Himalayas, this is what you end up with. It's one contiguous plate. There is no suture zone along the main central thrust, like some people would like to put. There's not an iota of oceanic rocks or ophiolites or anything. And the one horizon that restores from lesser Himalayas to greater Himalayas to the base of the Tethian is the Proterozoic sequence, the Hymanta group, which is the source for many of the leucogranites that were melting during the Miocene. Here we have a passive margin sequence with the Aphiolites on top. And this was the first thing to happen. This happened before the India-Asia collision, probably we think around the late Cretaceous, the same time as all the Aphiolites in uh, Oman and along the western part of Pakistan. So to put the model first, uh, here we are. The first thing. He said there were not ophioids. What? I feel like he himself is who I heard that from. So I mean, maybe in a previous presentation, or maybe not. I might not have understood where he was referring to because I'm pretty sure they're here. North, unless this is just pre where they are, like they're further to the north and this doesn't make it to the north. I do believe this is, I mean, this is, it must though, like this is lesser, greater. So this, I mean, there must be ophiolites in here based on previous things. So what did he say? And the one horizon that restores from lesser Himalayas to greater Himalayas to the base of the Tethian is the Proterozoic sequence, the Hymanta people would like to put. There's not an iota of oceanic rocks or ophiolites or anything. And the one you end up with, it's one contiguous plate. There is no suture zone along the main central thrust like some people main central thrust here a suture zone with ophiolites 
Okay, he's talking about right, right there, probably. People would like to put. There's not an iota of oceanic rocks or ophiolites or anything. And the one horizon that restores okay. from lesser Himalayas to greater Himalayas to the base of the Tethian is the Proterozoic sequence, the Hymantic group, which is the source for many of the leucogranites that were melting during the Miocene. Here we have a passive margin sequence with the aphiolites on top. And this was the first... During the Miocene, which is after the supernova. So basically there was material there from Proterozoic, which is before the Earth was attacked by a vortex weapon, basically, and before Venus supernova and moved it to become the new Earth through the cryogenian eon. Then we lived here a little bit, and then the uh, Eddia Karen and then the Cambrian, etc., were all during the Earth expansion. And then here we are. So, here the late Earth expansion is the heat of the supernova of the because essentially radioactive decay is assuming a constant decay rate but the earth supernova and these particles are supernova ing and so what really is missing is that this this is a a good sequence but it's not a good absolute time frame although it may also be that in a in a more cool way than like based on our perception of time but we're essentially within our perception of time, which was only thousands of years. There was actually able to be millions of years of existence that manifested on Earth through the process of the radioactive decay. Like it was almost like it was like a, a mirror. Like while things are are unstable for us, they're stable for that universe. And while they're on while they're stable for that universe, they're or unstable there, we're in stability, but like something of that nature, like different vibrations, like hydrogen, helium, it's different literal octaves that could manifest dependent on the circumstances, but those circumstances were basically really not typical. They literally require a supernova of a planet Just a supernova, and then the, the particles that are relative to that supernova would be seen as atoms by observers such as ourselves. Those particles, those observers would see that their system of their planet supernova. And they would say that it was a flooding event and, and like all these things that we see as post cryogenian basically like once we once the earth was earth was venus like and then it got swept into becoming the new earth by a supernova of what is currently venus and so then the uh <laughs> i know it, i know it's fucking ridiculous but it's true that's this that's the fucking <laughs> <laughs> So it became the new Earth, and uh, that was right after the cryogenian. And so, like, time was pretty much paused. Like, our current rate of time was passing the same way. And we, you know, we only made it like a thousand years or something, it seems. Like, the golden age. We only made it a thousand years before we fucking boom. The Earth is in a major change again. And the vortex weapon attack. Something of that nature, maybe not a thousand, but like a, a period. We didn't make it like millions of years. Like it was within thousands of years where basically things started to happen that uh, caused all these things to like cascade within a period of literally a year. <clears throat> like all of this was a year from the Cambrian explosion through to now. Or not now, to now, to the uh, to the end of the Great Flood, like the beginning of the Great Flood to the end of the Great Flood, 
was a year ish and that is what this is actually is from a uh from around post cryogenian to now <laughs> okay now that i've certainly made you persuaded let's carry on thing to happen this happened before the india asia collision probably we think around the late cretaceous the same time as all the ophiolites in uh, oman and along the western part of pakistan so to put the model first uh, here we are the first effects of the continental collision is a huge thrust sheet of ophiolite thrust onto the passive margin of india this is equivalent to the oman stage TM means Somerari, which is one of the two localities of ultra-high pressure metamorphism. And they are Permian units. I'm going to go back a little bit. Passive margin of India. This is equivalent to the Oman stage. TM means Somerari, which is one of the two localities of ultra-high pressure metamorphism. Ultra-high pressure metamorphism from the supernova that was channeled down a pathway. And they are Permian units uh, encased in a lot of Paleozoic uh, lower crust material. Permian is only 252 or something. Ends at 252. So 300, just about. To Mesozoic. Basically. Basically, leading into the supernova, there was some releasing of material that was going on that caused this red ophiolite. Okay, so the man basically an opening was occurring. Mantle was allowed to flow from the opening, producing a sheet of ophiolite. And then at some point, and basically after there, at the end of the Mesozoic, boom, supernova causing an actual metamorphosis metamorphosis of the the rocks down the channel during the either the last stage of ophiolite abduction or the first stage of collision those rocks indian plate margin rocks were subducted down to anything up to 27 kilobars this is the only real continental subduction we see anywhere there and both Somerari and Kagan are very well. Subduction occurred just after the supernova delayed reaction. The first thing that occurred was ophiolites. <sighs> could the could the supernova of the nucleus of the earth have just literally caused the Himalayas During the, either the last stage of rather than a particle under the surface there, I was fairly certain it was a particle under the surface there, but it does actually time with the, what appears to be the Earth's, like, overall expansion, so, like, the, it was a global event, so it was basically the Earth's supernova was 66 ma. <clears throat> So, I mean, unless it also caused, that's why it's a little, like, wait a minute. I could, 
but if it was from the core, then it would mu it would be much more upward projecting like this than through a channel like this. Although maybe that's just how it do energy flows. Is it took a path of least resistance and it bent over there and created the shallogram structure in the meantime while bending. So it actually was maybe coming up from the mantle direction, so from the core maybe, and just bent. But then that doesn't really make sense for the arc. The arc really seems to suggest a something over here, like as a source. Like it would have to basically have been coming straight up here and then just bent this way and arced away. Which is maybe possible that there was a energy flow from the core that went to like some some particle here that got basically caused to have a vortex around it that then that particle produced this shallygram feature while the energy flow itself was deflected off of the particle and caused to scatter in an arc shape. I mean, it's possible, but at this point, it seems like maybe possible and worth considering further as I go, but that's a quite the chain of events to be like the Himalayas. <laughs> so the Himalayas were caused by, like I keep changing it. Initially it was a flow of water this way. Now it's, and then it was a supernova of a particle here producing that. Now I'm like, well, maybe it wasn't, because, like, this doesn't really make sense with the shallygram structure. Usually the sh the particle there is actually would have supernova over here and over here, probably. So this, I would say, maybe is related to the shallygram structure, if this is, in course, of course, a shallygram is related to it in, in that it's maybe is re resultant from some sort of expulsion of energy that was focused in that direction <clears throat> maybe from below even but this doesn't like I've never seen a, a particle type feature here have some other feature like this that seems related to it like it doesn't actually seem they, they don't seem related but if from a if the core were to basically emit energy from the core through a particle that's here that maybe is one of the larger particles as we can see <laughs> maybe it was more substantial than other particles around the earth and although i would i would have thought that if it just like went through one it would have maybe done over by the core of the crust in my opinion but maybe i don't understand quite what's happened where the truest core is like this is this is the phi ratio or point of origin, but that doesn't mean like the actual energy like core is there anymore. Like because of the way things seem to be in like blocks, maybe like the the block that formed there has moved and moved around and then around and around until it's all the way over here and it's sitting here really and. I'm just assuming it's over here because that's where the phi ratio spirals into. <clears throat> but maybe it's there, and maybe the core would have focused some reason through there. Maybe it's just like where energy can leave the Earth easiest by going around this big particle there that kind of creates like a space around it. By just being so dense, like it supported the surroundings, so it allowed for openings to form. I'm just thinking about myself. <laughs>
Oh god, just the general nature of reality. Maybe I'm, I'm doing the same. Learn and learn and learn and learn and grow and grow and grow and grow and then suddenly like it allows that. We're all hanging out, we're all hanging out. <laughs> the pressure's off, pressure's off. Uh, explode. Oh. 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 Okay, let's carry on. Javophilite abduction, or the first stage of collision, those rocks, Indian plate margin rocks, were subducted down to anything up to 27 kilobars. This is the only real continental subduction we see anywhere there. And both Somerari and Kagan are very well dated now, which I'll come on to in a minute. Uh, during the next stage, the um, Somerari, uh, the ultra-high pressure rocks, come up extremely rapidly through the mantle until they're ensconced in the lower crust. And at this time, they're caught up in all this incredible isoclinal folding that affects kyanite-grade metamorphism. This is down to 10, 12 kilobars. And I think the, the real uh, secret for unlocking the crustal structure of the Himalayas lies in these metamorphic rocks, because you can do amazing things with metamorphism nowadays. Pressure, temperature, time paths, you can date monazites at every stage of the PT path. And uh, this is really what's uh, opened my eyes to the thermal evolution. And finally, we have the sulimonite uh, cordierite stage, which is, this is equivalent to the channel flow stage, where all of this is magnetite, and all of it is flowing between two enormous great ductile shear zones. Main central thrust below, South Tibetan detachment above. <coughs> so the first of the, the, these are the two localities of ultra-high pressure eclogites. They're incredibly fresh rocks. This is right up in uh, the Kharistan region. These were first discovered by Paddy O'Brien, and they've now been extremely well studied by several groups. And in Ladakh, we have another one, the Somerari eclogites, uh, where there has been some reports of microdiamonds and ultra-high pressure material, but we don't see pressures anything like these, these ones up here. It's the Taliban. <laughs> um, what we do see <clears throat> is uh, peak pressures of um, high-grade metamorphism somewhere in this region here, between 22 and 27 kilobars, and uh, extremely rapid rise. You must have some sort of slab break-off. To pull, you, you have the UHP eclogites in the continental margin, they're dragged down to depth. When the slab breaks off, they come up at extremely rapid plate tectonic rates. And Randy Paris proved this more than 10 years ago with less than a million years between the UHP rocks and some of the uh, lower rocks here. When they get entrained in the base of the crust in the kyanite grade, they follow a more normal exhumation, which is still fast. It's kyanite grade regional metamorphism. <coughs> When they come through the mantle, is that what he said? And then they reach the crust? Oh, yeah, crust 50 meters. Or a kilometer, 50 meters. Kilometers. <laughs> That's about the thickness of the crust, maybe even here. But really here, 50. I don't know about under the Himalayas region. Slab break off. To pull, you, you have the. UHP eclogites in the continental margin, they're dragged down to depth. When the slab breaks off, they come up at extremely rapid plate tectonic rates. And Randy Paris proved this more than 10 years ago with less than a million years between the UHP rocks and some of the uh, lower rocks here. When they get entrained in the base of the crust in the kyanite grade, they follow a more normal exhumation, which is still fast. It's kyanite grade regional metamorphism. <coughs> so when after the india asia collision, <clears throat> uh, the rocks start to deform. You are shortening somewhere in the region of three, four, five hundred kilometers, purely in the upper crust. These rocks here, this is in Ladakh, uh, there's probably about five kilometers between the mountain tops and the valley bottoms in the Zanskar River. Yellow is just tracing around bedding, and red is thrust fault. And this is all in unmetamorphosed sedimentary rocks, dominantly limestones. So this is how you collide in Deer and Asia, you shorten the crust and you thicken it, 
in the upper crust, and these rocks in the lower crust are going to be converted to kyanite and sulimanite gneisses. <coughs> we, uh, several of us have uh, done a lot of mapping in the Greater Himalayas. Uh, Dorji Grucic, uh, sorry, uh, Dorji Grucic in the, in the Bhutan region, and our work in Zanskar, and we both came up with this model, which is essentially exactly the same as channel flow. We didn't call it channel flow at the time, but it's pretty much the same. Now, all of these are, this is a map of the metamorphic isograds, and it's extremely difficult to make a map of isograds. You're basically looking at the first incoming index minerals, storolite, kyanite, sulimanite, muscovite, sulimanite, cave felspar, and magnetite. <coughs> Glacier. Oh, the dendrite features are so clear in here. Concentrate on the Everest region <clears throat> where we've been working for the last few years. At the top of the slab is the South Tibetan detachment, this low angle normal fault, which is spectacularly well exposed on the north side of Everest and all the way along the Rongbuk Valley in Tibet. So this diagram is based on Photographs, it's definitely there. So this is a low angle normal fault putting Ordovician limestone on the summit of Everest over the yellow band, which is an upper green schist, lower amphibolite fasces marble. This is storolite grade schist. And then all of the orange and red are sulimonite, K felspar, magnetite, and leuka granite. So there is a huge, the highest mountain in the world, <coughs> Everest, has two normal faults running through it. One chopping right through the summit there, putting these green schists above the very high-grade gneisses, and on the very top of Everest are Ordovician limestones, which still have uh, some relic fossils in that you can date. Uh, this is looking straight up the north face from the wrong book side, and um, a lot of the uh, thin sections of this, uh, this is a sample of the summit limestone collected by Ed Hillary on the first ascent date, 29th of May, 53. And this one collected from the yellow band by the previous uh, attempt by Evans and Bordelon. Uh, these are both in Cambridge now, but this clearly is a sedimentary rock, and this is clearly a metamorphic rock. And the boundary between the two is the Chomalangma detachment. Now, beneath the normal faults at the top, there is a, a section, anything up to 50 kilometers wide, very shallow dipping, which is all in sulimonite grade magnetite up here. So you have an inverted metamorphic sequence along the main central thrust and actually a right way up sequence along the South Tibetan detached zone and this huge area in the middle of the slab which is basically at partial melt temperatures and uh, forming a lot of leuka granites. <coughs> uh, not sure what's happened there. Uh, within the slab itself, <clears throat> there are numerous uh, ductile shear zones and thrusts. And what we found from extensive uranium lead zircon and monazite dating is that most of the older Himalayan leuka granites, the tourmaline, muscovite, uh, garnet leuka granites, occur in the core of the slab around the south side of Nupsi. These are about 23, 24. And um, as you go up, the PT conditions decrease, and as you go down towards the main central thrust, they decrease as well, away from this central zone of magnetite. So the boundary conditions for channel flow is that you've got a very thick zone of partially melted rocks in the middle crust. This is not the lower crust, this is purely the middle crust. Sulimonite grade magnetites, leuka granites, bounded by brittly deforming tethian zone above, and a rigid Indian plate lower crust, which is dominantly Archean, and Paleoproterozoic, which is unsubductible. So when you restore the whole Himalayas, you must underthrust at least the southern part of Tibet, uh, the Archean Indian Shield, you must thrust it underneath the plateau in exactly the way that Argand uh, described many years ago. So you have right way up metamorphic sequence along the top and synchronous motion on both the ductile shear zones, the MCT and the STD. <coughs> so the results of this crustal thickening, <coughs> largely because the Hymansa complex, the Proterozoic black shales, are incredibly rich in uranium. These are the protolith rocks that melt when you 
increase the pressure and temperature to form the leucogranites. And these are the famous Himalayan leucogranites that form most of the big peaks. These are 100% crustal melts. There's no mantle component. There's a local magnetic source, usually with sillimanite, sometimes with cordierite, at varying stages of the melting process. Incredibly high... 100% crustal melt supernova. <sighs> Radiogenic heat production in the middle crust, and the emplacement is along giant multiple sill complexes. Neo. Pretty sure they're saying the. The crust is from the Neo-Proterozoic that was then heated. With the uranium lead ages spanning those 23 to about 16. So they have incredibly high strontium 87, 86 ratios, 100% crustal melts. There's no mantle component whatsoever. You can melt a pelite, you can melt a grey wacky, you can actually melt a cave feldspar algon nice to produce these granites. And all the structures in the granites are horizontal sills. So they are isotopically heterogeneous at, a, at all stages. They're very famous for containing tourmaline. Isotopically heterogeneous. Juice these granites. And all the structures in the granites are horizontal sills. So they are isotopically heterogeneous at, a, at all stages. They're very famous for containing tourmaline. Horizontal sill granite. That's right. One second, pardon me. Hundred percent mantle crust or hundred percent melted crust, no mantle. Isotopic heterogeneity of source. So, and then put horizontal cells or scale, horizontal cell. Spot algon nice to produce these granites. Oh, yeah. And all the structures in the granites are horizontal cells. So they are isotopically heterogeneous at, a, at all stages. They're very famous for containing tourmaline, and uh, the source of the tourmaline is a very boron-rich uh, sediment, uh, probably the high mantis sediment, uh, released from the breakdown of clay minerals. They're very famous for containing tourmaline, And uh, the source of the tourmaline is a very boron-rich uh, sediment. Uh, Uh, probably the high mantis sediment, uh, released from the breakdown of clay minerals. And these are the classic structures you get with tourmaline quartz shawl. You get exactly the same in the Dartmoor granite in Cornwall, where they're called shawl rocks. Uh, the emplacement of these granites is all horizontal. There's no ballooning pluton at all. 
These are the Himalayan granites in white, and the dark are the sulimonite gneisses. You can see the old... No bloom in Pluton at all. Small dikes. They're just crystals. Feeding magma up to higher sills, but and great big zealots of sulimonite gneiss at the top. But basically, everything is related to horizontal motion in the foot wall of the low angle detachment, the STD. These are the two dehydration melting reactions. Uh, the first one is the muscovite dehydration, which produces the standard tourmaline garnet muscovite leucogranate. And the slightly higher temperature one is the biotite dehydration, where you have sulimonite and cordierite, um, garnet and melt. The stable phase at relatively low pressures is cordierite, and the stable phase above uh, five kilobars is garnet. So you have spectacular um, varieties of leucogranites and migmatites. It's one of the most spectacular parts of the world to study migmatites. These are just a series of, of beautiful exposures along some of the stream sections south of Manasli. Um, <coughs> a typical PT path for these rocks in the channel flow is it crosses the first melting reaction here, which produces what we call the normal type granites, garnet tourmaline muscovite granite, and at very lower pressures, uh, more cordierite bearing granites. Uh, most of the top of uh, this is the largest area of the late cordierite granites, the entire top of Makalu is fed by this sill. Uh, this is on the Barren Glacier in the, on the southern side of Nepal. And um, <coughs> this, you can see that the uh, cordierite granites here feeding the summit are actually cutting all the earlier uh, tourmaline two mica granites uh, on the margins of the dike. Uh, this is just an outcrop to show you the spectacular deformation. This is one boulder, literally the size of that carpet and it has seven different phases of cross-cutting granite. And pretty much these granites are coming in at relatively low temperatures, and then they freeze pretty instantly uh, to produce all of these. And we've been doing uranium lead age dating on all of these different phases, and uh, they, they vary both spatially and um, with depth as well. So this is on the Kangshan Glacier on the north side of Everest, uh, where we have, this is in the core of the channel, when the whole melt is being extruded out to the south, and within that are giant boulders, it's almost like a river, with giant boulders of these migmatite, sulimonite gneisses and earlier formed leucogranites. And uh, our students, uh, John Cottle and um, Micah Jessup, did a lot of work uh, dacing these rocks. <coughs> and what it's almost like a river. What uh, John found in particular was that there is a southward younging of ages. So here you see the spectacular early sills, which are folded, cut by undeformed set two dikes. And you can date these and date these, and the time periods of deformation are spectacularly short lived across all of this stuff. So um, what we found in the in the Rongbuk Valley is one of the best sections because you have this 3D exposure from the summit of Everest till the STD plunges down beneath the Tibetan Plateau and you can follow it along strike uh, for the whole period. <clears throat> and uh, a summary diagram here shows all of John's uranium lead ages at the Kangshung. This is in the guts of Everest. I feel like he's trying to tell me something. And this is Thongmong, which is right in the northern tip of the GHS before you go underneath the like, Tibetan. What I do? What, what I do? Okay. So we think that there is a general northerly younging trend uh, with time along the wrong book. This is on the south side of the uh, Nepalese Himalayas, a spectacular cliff section showing Amadablan. This is just south of Everest. Anyone who's trekked up there would have seen this peak. And when you look very closely at this, you can see that these granites are intruding as layer parallel sills with dikes feeding magma up to the top. And the reason they're bending over to the north is because the STD is up here and cutting through the Everest Massif off to the left. So this is a summary diagram off to the left. Bending to the north, as he's in this way.
off to the left. So this is a summary diagram of the um, ages of the STD. <laughs> and um, Freaking and just, and the whole thing, STD, STD, STD. <laughs> what, would, what we did was try to restore this section. There's absolutely no way you can restore. I would feel too uncomfortable to not use a different name. I mean, at least just say the whole thing and just go with it. South Tibetan, whatever. D something. A ductilely deformed channel of magnetite. But what See, you I can do is use pressure. All, all I know is the letters uh, detachment. Just to constrain roughly the depth. And if you assume that the S. Pardon me, pardon me. Not to be childish. TD is the same angle during the formation. Then you've got to bring these leucogranites from this period here about 100 kilometers north of where they are now at the foot of Everest. So that's... Exclamation of Sil and whatever, Nises, Cal, Silicates, and Leucograms from 10 to 15 kilometers depth and 80 to 100 kilometers north. Melting zone. Let's say Everest is there. Who cares? 100 kilometers. So not, not that far. So they're saying they're coming from like here. Let's say not that far. Melting zone. Although this is just probably the mantle to the mantle. I don't know. This must be the mantle. But really, the particle could have been in the mantle way further. That's the Ordovician limestone. That's the. Uh the yellow band and the green schist fascist rocks, and this is all magnetite down here. <coughs> so this is a summary of the Himalayan. Um, the Himalayan uh, thermal history. You have uh, collision at 50 million years from then, post-orogenic, uh, sorry, post-collisional crustal shortening. We don't know how much. It's absolutely impossible to restore sections through the GHS, so I wouldn't frankly believe any of these balanced cross sections across the entire Himalayas. You can restore the Tethian zone above and you can restore the lesser Himalayas, but there's no way you can restore the ductilely extruding middle crust of the greater Himalayan sequence. What we do know is that the syncollisional eclogites are forming pretty much at the same time as collision. And I, we have exactly the same rocks in Oman, so I suspect that these, the very deep subduction of the leading margin of India are actually the final stage of the ophiolite abduction rather than the collision. And then we have the kyanite grade collision which is dated between 35 and 30 and the sillimanite grade partial melting between 24 and... ...the same rocks in Oman, so I suspect that these, the very deep subduction of the leading margin of India, are actually... Same rocks in Oman, interesting the final stage of the ophiolite abduction rather than the collision. And then we the eclogites. We have the kyanite grade collision, which is dated between 35 and 30, and the sillimanite grade partial melting between 24 and 15, producing these spectacular leucogranites. So this was the time of channel flow. Channel flow is not operating today. It's seismically dead. Yeah, I feel like it was just carving, it, like the supernova was occurring, and it was just shoving things out of the way that were in the way, including these eclogites. And then this stuff started to come out until finally, like, there was a pathway for the ether energy to just channel through and start to actually heat the rock enough to create metamorphosism which then occurred at the later phases. And crustal melting. And I'm not sure what channel flow is referring to. Of channel flow. Channel flow is not operating today. 
It's seismically dead. There is nothing happening on the STD or the MCT. The seismic boundary is way down to the south along the main boundary. It's <clears throat> just basically that the supernova was shoving material between the layers. And it's not anymore, I guess. Boundary thrust. Well, this is the Annapurna section. Assuming a super particle within the Earth's supernova didn't cause the Himalayas. I know, I know, guys, I know. Uh, Dalagiri is up here. This is all Cambrian Ordovician limestone at the base of the Tethian sequence. And all of this is sulimonite and kyanite grade partial melting with the famous inverted metamorphic sequence on the main central thrust. So you have a low angle normal fault here, which is responsible for extruding the magma in the foot wall. That low angle normal faults do definitively exist and they must have been active at low angles in order to exhume this stuff during the channel flow. <coughs> I... I think there is um, no evidence that Tibet or the Himalayas are collapsing, so I don't like the orogenic collapse story. Normal faults do exist. In Tibet, they're oriented north-south, east-west extension. But because of India, the lower crust of India, the... Oh, people have suggested that the Tibetan plateau is like a collapsing... previously, uh, like, Himalayan range... Key and pal it's interesting. <clears throat> I wonder if a body of water that is a wave would produce the same uh, like increase in elevation like that behind the wave to a point where a plateau exists there, like in a legitimate way. I'm trying to think. I know, like. Seemingly, like it should generally produce some uplift. It's just the, the Tibetan plateau is so long. It's like a. It's under thrusting it. It is just jacking it up and jacking it up. And everywhere you see. Uh, the Greater Himalayas, there is no evidence of anything falling down or collapsing. So here is... Uh... Except for north of Tibet. Also, maybe in Damodar Kund, which is in the Himalayas, there's probably some evidence of Shaligram features to suggest the potential, if not the actuality, which is only maybe found in the, uh, in the opening into the earth up here. A picture of that same normal fault. On the hanging wall, we have Cambrian limestones of the Annapurna Formation. And here we have, this is all calc myelinites dominantly, uh, produced from the Cambrian limestones. And immediately underneath it, uh, huge amounts of marble at high temperatures and kyanite gneisses with partial melt. So there's a massive PT jump across this ductile shear zone. Uh, again, if you play the same restoration games, uh, this is what you see now. There's three rocks here. The sediments at the base of the Dalagiri, which are purely burial metamorphism, anything up to about two kilobars, two and a half kilobars, uh, the tremolite gneisses from the Langtang unit here and the kyanite migmatites down here. And if you use the pressures to constrain the depth, you have to restore them to this sort of position. And then you're bringing this one up to accrete with this and then both of these up to accrete with that. <coughs> All of this leads to channel flow. And um, everything on the right-hand side of the diagram here is constrained by the in-depth and the high-climb experiments, geophysics. Once you cross north of the Indus suture zone, you don't have the depth constraints. What you do have in the Himalayas is spectacular depth constraints as you go north. So we know that this is the basic geometry of the mid-crustal channel. And what is thrusting down underneath it is dominantly Archean and Paleoproterozoic which could be forming in eclogite fasces down here, uh, depending on who you like to believe. Uh, so putting together all the uh, uranium lead ages, 
the, uh, most of the melting, the crustal melting, which triggers channel flow, is happening up here, uh, generally between about 25 and 16. And as soon as you run out of melt, that stuff just flows. As soon as you start melting it, it just flows out to the surface. And you had incre incredibly rapid uh, PTT paths, exhumation of these rocks from relatively shallow mid-crustal levels. So this is the uh, channel flow model, which I uh, like very much. I think it fits all the geology, the PT work, and we even have constraints on the lower crust. These high-pressure granulites in southern Tibet, there happen to be some spectacular Shoshanite and Adakite dikes that intrude up through all of this, and they're ripping off bits of the upper mantle and bits of the lowermost crust. And when you see that, this is one of these uh, Shoshanite dikes intruding at 12.7 million years in southern Tibet. Um, <coughs> it is full of xenoliths, tiny little xenoliths, about that big. And these are both mafic and felsic granulites at extremely high temperatures and high pressures. Uh, they also have zircons and monazites, which you can date. So we absolutely know that at 15, 16 million years ago, the crust underneath southern Tibet was extremely thick and extremely hot. <coughs> so here's a summary of all of the Everest uh, PTT work. I'm gonna... <coughs> yep, yep. Hot, <coughs> so here's a summary of all of the Everest uh, PTT work. I'm going to skip along pretty quickly here, actually. And as I said, the Himalayas are very... Um, pretty much uniform, the whole length of the mountain belt. Uh, they've undergone the very similar kyanite and sulivanite grade events, except for the very far northwest in Nanga Parbat and the very far northeast in Namchi Bawa, the two syntaxes area, areas. And in this region of Nanga Parbat, it is quite the most, some of the most incredible rocks I've ever seen. Most of the core of Nanga Parbat here is composed of extremely high-grade magnetite and like a bunch of like a hub of some channel flows I don't know <sighs> crazy holy crap <laughs> the eddy of the wave this does seem to have an eddy to it I never really yeah it definitely I would call this the eddy in the same way as over here it's got the eddy and then down here it's got an eddy the wave that there's an eddy here I guess there is one here I still think this is very much the same formation though like this is for sure part of it that just separated I guess it does seem to have separated in some way but 
besides that uh, the spillover from the colliding waves. Because I essentially was like, here's a wave, here's a wave, they're colliding. And so this one spilled over this one. So there we go. And when we have dated uh, these MIGNOTYPES, uh, Jim Crowley and Sam Bowering were collaborating on the dating. These are the cordierite bearing leukogranites that are intruding up extensional uh, shear zones um, here. And uh, these big green things are cordierite, and there's tourmaline, garnet, muscovite. Um, some of the ages are actually less than one million year old. So we're looking here at rocks that have been exhumed from about three and a half, four kilobars in 700,000 years. And that is a phenomenal exhumation rate. There's nowhere else in the world that is exhumed as high as that. This is the outcrop that David G was talking about, where the Precambrian gneisses of Nanga Parbat metamorphosed during the Miocene and the Pleistocene are thrust over practically unconsolidated gravels of the Indus River. Um, so they, these rocks in Nanga Parbat have been through the whole cycle. Apart from all the early Precambrian and Cambrian collisional events, uh, they've been through the high pressure eclogites, which still occur in parts of Nanga Parbat. Uh, they've been through a major kyanite event and a widespread sulimonite event and a very young sulimonite cordierite event. Mm -hmm. So I think they're pretty... <sighs> Let me just write this down. Fifty to forty-seven. U H P Anglo Gates. Thirty-seven thirty. Kyanites. Twenty-four nineteen. Sidna. Sidney Man Knights. Seventeen eleven Northern Himalaya and it says Amma Drime. Whatever that is, must be a place. Three to Point oh seven point seven Nanga Parbak Parbat Silliman Silly Manites Cordierite Melts. A widespread sulimonite events and a very young sulimonite cordierite event. So I think they're pretty good representative of metamorphism that is actually forming today underneath parts of the Himalayas. Okay, um, well Tibet, as everyone knows from all of Peter's work, um, Tibet is the largest exposed area of high elevation and thick crust in the world and some of the big debates are um, when did the plateau rise? Um, <coughs> this is <coughs> most of the geophysics constrained from the in-depth experiments and the high climb and the earlier Owens and Zant. Most of these models uh, show that the southern half of Tibet up until about the Bangong suture zone was under thrust by cold Indian mantle lithosphere. Um, we don't know exactly when, but what we do know is that the plateau are absolutely covered by these post-collisional Shoshanites and Adakites. And these are spectacular rocks that come, Shoshanites come out of the mantle, and Adakites come from a garnet-rich eclogite or garnet amphibolite source, and they are present all over the plateau. 
Sun Ling Chung from Taiwan has spent 20 years working on these rocks and dating them. And he's come up with a spectacular, I think, uh, time-space diagram. This is India going north across the plateau. And these ages, our ages are constrained by the distribution of Tibetan magnetism. And the story basically is that as India is shunting northwards, under thrusting Tibet, it is progressively moving the hot Asian mantle northwards. So now, in the last 10 million years or so, the only young Choshenitic volcanism occurs up in the Kunlun in the far north, but in the central Changtang belt and in the Karakoram, it basically went on pretty much from collision onwards. <coughs> that. Okay, Indian block time. Millions of years ago. <clears throat> I'm not sure what this is over here. Angle of convergence degree from north. million years ago so now we see this back in time in the Miocene we saw Lhasa and the Luco granites. This is kind of like the pre supernova supernova, and then the actual supernova. Although this actually is after the supernova of the Earth, which was here. Hmm. Changtang belt and in the Karakoram. It I was thinking, so I can just vocalize, I guess, but instead of not saying anything, because I don't know what to make of that. Essentially, they're suggesting that the oh, across time, the activity magmatism has generally moved northward i guess basically went on pretty much from collision onwards i might need to look this paper up It is progressively moving the hot Asian mantle northwards. So now, in the last 10 million years or so, the only young Choshenitic volcanism occurs up in the Kunlun in the far north, but in the central Changtang belt and in the Karakoram, it basically went on pretty much from collision onwards. <coughs> so putting all this together, uh, here's a model of what we think the Tibetan crust could look like in southern Tibet. All of this, felsic granulites, mafic granulites, ultramafic restites and eclogites are constrained by the xenoliths coming up the Shoshanites. Uh, the Shoshanites are coming up from the mantle, plucking off bits of this lower crust as they come up. Most of this is old pre-collisional Gangdizi type granites. And the adakites you have to melt from something like a garnet bearing lower crustal source. Oh, sorry, I've seen that. Okay, well, this is a spectacular outcrop. I'm sure anyone who's been to Tibet has seen this. Uh, Paul Cap has done a lot of work on here. What we can, though, 
is that the, uh, there is a major unconformity that is regional across the whole of the Lassa block. And this is below the Lingzizong volcanics at 60 million years ago. All of this folding must therefore have occurred prior to the India Asia collision. We also Some know that waves. the youngest marine sediments anywhere in the last block. Literally, though, it's literally like waves. <laughs> They're not just like, it looks like waves. <laughs> are about 130 million years down here beneath the Takina red bed. So from 130 million years, Tibet has got to be above sea level. Now, um, what is happening with the eastern margin of Tibet is a big problem because this is uh, Wiki and Marin Clark's uh, model of lower crustal flow, and uh, this is the active GPS. I think there is no way that you can relate the GPS, which is purely a sufficient deformation, to anything that's happening in the middle and lower crust. We know that the upper, middle, and lower crust are completely detached all through southern Tibet. Um, we've been doing a lot of work in the last two years on... What? Upper, middle, and lower crust are completely detached all throughout southern Tibet. So we cannot... You know, honestly, if there's a fucking mountain range, right? A, a slow slope up to a mountain range that's been formed here, it kind of would make sense. Maybe for GPS to see, like, a, in the Tibetan Plateau, the things kind of sloping back down, especially towards this. Although, it'd be interesting if this literally, like, circled. <laughs> it all pointed in, although this seems to be going that way still. A little surprising, honestly, I'm not gonna lie. Upper, middle, and lower crust are completely detached all through southern Tibet. Um, we've been doing a lot of work in the last two years on the Gonga Shan granites. This is the Shan Shuihe Fault, one of the most active faults in Tibet. Uh, there was a paper by Roger et al. with it a looks, very young zircon age. That's why we went there. It literally looks like a fucking... Sp like a spiralling, like a physically spiralling, coiled, like a coil of some material. Yeah. But actually about 80% or more of this batholith is old pre-collisional hornblende biotite granodara. Most of this goes back to the Indocinian, and it is not uh, applicable to crustal melting like we see in the Himalayas. Um, it goes back to when? So there's actually um, applicable to... to crustal melting like we see in the Himalayas. Eastern Tibet, Indonesian, and when, when Indonesia was made. So there's some, there literally is a relationship between Indonesia and the Eastern Tibetan region of the Himalayas, maybe? Is that what's going on there? Um in like a timing of when uh, there must be a reason it's called Indonesian that's because of the timing of what occurred then so there's actually uh, huge amounts of variety in the Gonga Shan granite uh, most of this batholith is pretty inaccessible but there are two very good road transects that go up here and these are all the early diuretic rocks <coughs> um. so we can summarize <clears throat> uh, most of the metamorphism in eastern Tibet, particularly from Damba, is all Indocinian. There's no Cenozoic metamorphism at all. There's nothing young. Everything is either Precambrian or Indocinian. Um, there is no geological evidence for crustal flow. In the Himalayas, there's abundant geological evidence for the greater Himalayas thrusting to the south you never see that along the eastern margin of Tibet. And all of um, There is no geological evidence for crustal flow. In the Himalayas, there's abundant geological evidence for the greater Himalayas thrusting to the south. You never see that along the eastern margin of Tibet. 
And all of the granites are dominantly related to the uh, Triassic, Jurassic, Indocinian orogeny. Uh, the other major problem is the faults, the strike slip faults in uh, Tibet. This is the Karakoram Fault, where Peter and I have been several trips. Uh, this is, we've had incredible discussions with our French colleagues going on for about two decades on this fault. And for me, it's very clear that all of these magnetites and granites are related to the regional metamorphism you see all across the Valtore. They are absolutely nothing to do with shear heating on the fault. The fault cuts everything. The youngest granites in the Karakoram are as young as about 10, and uh, the fault must have been initiated uh, prior to that. Some of the ductile fabrics on these outcrops, this is Richard Phillips, who's published a lot, my student, and um, it does have a major difference in exhumation rates on either side of it. Uh, it also has spectacular pseudo tacolites The fault is pretty much dead now. There's almost no seismicity on it. But it does show huge amounts of pseudo uh which are, you don't really see on the Shan Shui Hei fault. Well, I've mapped all of this part of the Karakoram. Uh, you can't go to this region here. It's right on the triple junction of Pakistan, India, and China. But uh, that contact there is a very, is this one. It's a contact metamorphic aureole between the 20 million year old Baltoro granite and carboniferous black shale. It's very, very clear, black and white. You can trace that with a dashed line to intersect with the Karakoram fault there. And on the other side, on the Ladakhi side, at the top of the Siachen Glacier, that same contact is very clear there. That is about 25 kilometers. This is the most active fault in Tibet, and it seems to have just a minimal amount of motion on it. It's quite Pretty good. Pretty good. I've, let's see. I can't recall honestly specifically. There's definitely been some some interesting things. Like it's, if for sure, there's heat involved, which is strongly suggestive of a supernova. Oh my god, I'm not a big fan of that show. Been watching Andor. It's alright, part of me got been involved. People involved in Andor. Uh, it's pretty good, but I'm, I'm just fucking busy. Oh my god. Fucking distraction. I mean, it's, it's just like football and shit. It's like, dude, we got, we got problems. Fucking football, this gambling fucking scam where they don't even play legit games. It's just fucking utter abuse of the people's willingness to participate because there's no alternative. <laughs> like they got the monopoly on the entertainment. No one can compete with a fucking franchise sport like that. So they gotta fucking play right. It's just it's just the problem is like what when the world is collapsing, it really brings sheds light on the fact of the matter that it's fucking ridiculous that people would be manipulating a game just cheating for the purpose of like making money literally <laughs> like it's corrupted at that point it's one thing if like they're really trying their best to be the, the best version of themselves and they're crushing it and that's that and that's the story. But if they're just fucking paying off the refs, <laughs> like at that point the whole game is fucking ruined. Might as well just not fucking, like people, 
literally still watch, though. I'm like, I got other shit to do. And then these shows bring propaganda in and just fucking dilute and corrupt the show. Just fucking... I ain't got time to feed that beast shit. Like, fucking fix the system first and foremost, and then we can entertain. I want fucking... I want this propaganda. It's not entertainment when it's propaganda. There, It literally is propaganda when it's propaganda. It's absurd. People that died in the soccer game, yeah. <sighs> yup, just fucking... It's probably time to wake up from this bullshit, I think. Fucking Russia just bombed Kiev, I read. I didn't look into it either. I just saw Russia bombed Kiev. Okay. Maybe that's a little, a little escalatory. I could have sworn that I read it here. So we think the Karakoram Fault um, actually accommodates about 120 kilometers uh, maximum, could be as little as 25, since about 15 million years. The metamorphism and the granite it. intrusion all oh, occurred sorry, before yeah. slight, strike slip shearing. Luca granite dikes are syn kinematic with the ductile shearing, but none of them cross cut the brittle faulting. In fact, the ages of the metamorphism there are exactly like we see in Pakistan. They're late Cretaceous. Just waiting for me to watch it. Very fussy. Um, like fucking, and the fault so is crazy. pretty much oh, I am not understood. Yeah. I was making dead today. So either it's moving with huge... I know my parents just want to spend time and so on, but I'm like, dude... Like, I got no money, dude. What the fuck do you guys want from me? <laughs> I'm literally trying to make it I'm not trying to fucking sit around and relax. I know it seems that way. That's the problem is people think I'm doing something I'm not. They don't fucking understand. No. Just facts. No one fucking comprehends what I'm doing really. Not enough. The amounts of recurrence time or uh, something very strange is going on, but I don't think the character of the fault has been solved by any means. Uh, the Altintag fault, again, uh, these rates are reasonably well constrained. The GPS rates are extremely well constrained. Like people only I'm not sure I believe them. these I rates them very them. much, um, yeah, but we don't know what the total geological too. offset on the Altintag is. Really um, makes me wander across the Karakoram in North Pakistan is shit. actually equivalent to the Changtang block in central Tibet. And these rocks here give us world. most of the Karakoram is composed of high grade metamorphic rocks and granite. You know, you're going to All this stuff the here with an so enormous so batholith in the middle, the Baltoro <laughs> crustal melt batholith. The so these rocks give us some you. indication of what could be going on underneath the central. I know you're not really responsible, but you know, you'll take the responsibility. Central part of Tibet today. And when we've done an enormous amount of uranium lead dating, most of this is done with Randy Parrish. Um, and the, there's a whole bunch of pre collisional diuretic type gneisses related to the Andean margin, and an enormous number of peaking post collisional metamorphic ages culminating in this time here when most of the Baltoro granite was intruded. At the same time, you have lamprified dikes coming out of the map. It would be fine if I could fucking pause. I can't pause this recording and then continue recording. Like, if I hit record, it's going to stop. And then I would need to edit it to finish this fucking seven minutes. Mantle. And I think the sheer volume of granite in the Karakoram 
is indicative that you've got to have mantle, some amount of mantle heating. It's not like the Himalayas at all. Which Cease fire, no. They're going to do it simultaneously, like the Bible says. The world will call for peace and security, and that's when calamity will fall on them. I wouldn't be surprised if like, there's some initial wave of calling for peace in the like outcome of what's going on right now. I have almost no mantle component to this. Uh, the crux of the uh, Trango Towers, this is a one-to-one -one cross section. There's no vertical exaggeration. These things are two or three kilometers vertically. And most of that batholith is between 17 and 18 million years. Um, so you can summarize all Whoa. this in a time chart. And um, India Asia collision, 50 million years. All of these sulimonite gneisses and migmatites are occurring in an Andean type setting prior to the collision of India and Asia. And then you have everything in blue is a period of peak sulimonite or kyanite metamorphism, dated with monazites and extremely well constrained. And what you see is a pretty much continuous record of high grade metamorphism throughout not only the post collision, but also some of the pre collision. And this, I think, could be indicative of what's going on under parts of the Changtang block. <coughs> um, okay, um, we're, we're moving around the corner a bit, and I'm working now in Burma, in the Mogok belt, and these rocks here have a very similar uranium-lead history to the eastern Himalayan syntaxis. So we're sort of tracing the Lhasa block, the southern margin of Tibet, around the bend, into Burma and eventually down into Thailand and restoring it with the various um, time constraints that we have. Um, he keeps jumping over the maps, so... The other ones I've seen him do are really inf informative. This, I think he, he is not talking about his own research about the Tibetan plateau. I think is why this is a little less... Uh, in for informative than the rest, like the, beef, the Himalayas is his focus for, for sure. So I don't think this literally might not even be at all his research, and he's just kind of getting a bearing on the locale from other people's research, and just kind of trying to literally restate it but because it's not his own research he can't quite say it as well as the individual whose research it is and he's not like adding to it so he's pretty much just like there's this element maybe of it being less informative than the previous part um okay here's a model that was uh, published by uh my student Richard Palin, who did a lot of spectacular uranium lead age dating on all of these granites. Although maybe I'm mistaken, and he's really been all over the place with his studies. Uh, he's for sure heavily studied the, this region, as well as Oman, it looks like. And who knows what else. I just have watched a few of his lectures, because he's like the, the Himalayas guy that I found. And uh, we think now that the thick crust and the um, was actually inherent there from at least 45 million years ago. You cannot have kyanite and sulimonite grade metamorph. That's pretty much all I wanted to know. And he did add some tidbits to the Tibetan plateau, but 50, 50 million years. So pretty much after the supernova of the particle in the region. It rocks without having some sort of thick crust. Although I'm not sure. I've been kind of thinking it may be a little more complex. Like the supernova of the Earth itself was at that time of 65 million years, which is kind of when this all started to happen. So it seems like they're literally either simultaneous or the same event. Either two events that are like a chain reaction of one big particle 
in or near the crust or and the uh, man's core also simultaneously supernova and the two just doing it together or that uh, the core supernova and it basically sends an energy flow into the North Tibetan region which then caused a the Shaligram feature as well as cause the energy to be deflected away from the particle and into an arc. But then it, it's a, it seems a little much of a stretch at that stage. You cannot quantify it. We have no idea how high the Karakoram was. We have no idea how high Tibet was. But what we can say is that when you've got a period of high-grade metamorphism, you've got to have some sort of thick crust. And if you've got thick crust, you've got to have some sort of topography. So the conclusions of Tibetan Karakoram, thick crust, high elevation, we, I think, was a pre-collision. I just don't want to watch this show. <sighs> it's fucking... ...event along the south. The Gangdizi geology is exactly the geology that you see all the way along the Peru-Chile margin. Huge I-type granite batholiths, huge amounts of calcalkaline volcanic rocks. Um, I don't think the plateau uh, rose... Um, sorry, I don't think the plateau rose uh, seven, eight million years ago. I think it's been around for a long time older than that. Um, there is no real evidence for mantle delamination. Looking at the ultra-potassic Shoshanite ages, they were occurring all the way from 45 up to the uh, day before yesterday up in the Kunlun. The strike slip faults are very large scale and impressive, but they have very limited offsets. And we still don't really know the offsets on most of the Tibetan strike slip faults. The earthquakes are restricted to the seismogenic zone. Some of the... Um, <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, some of these deep earthquakes underneath the Himalayas, lots of arguments between the creme brulee people and the jelly sandwich people. I personally cannot see how you can have temperatures as low enough to make an earthquake in the mantle. So to me, this has to be the crust is deeper and thicker than we think it is. Anything up to 90 kilometers deep. Um, Post-collisional crustal melts are very rare, but there's three areas. Uh, the Ulug Mustak, where Pisa has also worked. Deep earthquakes, And the said. Western Nianshan Tangler, little bits of crustal melt leucogranite. And these little tiny, very young granites in Gonga Shan, four or five million years old. What they result from is oh. anybody's guess. And uh, that is a real problem. That right. we haven't yet solved by any stretch of the imagination. So to conclude, the time scales of orogeny, the ophiolite abduction phase onto a passive margin, pre-collision, is extremely well tied down in Oman. The northern margin of India went through all of this with the ophiolites along the southern margin of Kohistan, the Spontang ophiolite and most of the yeah, ophiolites, sick. the good Ganser ophiolites under Tibet. Uh, Himalayan-type collision, it's... 50 million years of deformation, 50 million years of metamorphism, and it's still ongoing. Karakoram-type metamorphism includes the pre-collisional and the post-collisional, and that is absolutely huge. It's been going on pretty much peaking for 65 million years throughout the pre- and the post-collisional phases. So in conclusion, I'd like to pay my respects to Emil R. Gand, who 90 years ago, I think, got it dead right. The Himalayas is composed entirely of Proterozoic and younger rocks. You never see Archean or Paleoproterozoic rocks in the major part of the Himalayas. That stuff. I could not pay actual attention for the last like 10 minutes. It's detached and the Himalayas has shortened. We don't know, but by several hundred kilometers. The I don't know how much they fucking interrupt me when they just knock on my door. I'm like, uh, how many times do I gotta fucking say, I'm fucking busy if I'm... <laughs>
Oh my god. Only place you can put Literally, it's so hard to focus. Any fucking distraction is hard to focus. <laughs> the lower crust that restores underneath <sighs> that is by shoving it underneath the Tibetan plateau. So I think that was an incredible piece of insight. Yeah, and I just don't know what he said. I gotta watch this later. It's as simple as that. I don't fucking. I can't pay attention while thinking. Like the combo is too hard. Like if I'm not thinking directly about what's being said, I'm not gonna fucking pick up what's being said. <sighs> All right then. I guess I'm done recording then. At least. Peace out to recording.